Okay, I think we're going to get started. Welcome everyone, thank you for coming out this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone to please silence their cell phones before we get started. Thank you for being here for this presentation into the heart of Cuba with international documentary photographer, Daryl Hawk. He will discuss his style, philosophy, and various techniques used when photographing, photographing subject matter. He has 30 years of experience exploring remote places, published five books, and is a member of the Explorers Club, fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, and member of the Professional Photographers Association. Please welcome Daryl Hawk. Cuba, so close, yet so far. <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, I know Cuba's on everybody's minds, and I would also like to thank Emily for all the hard work that she did to put together this event tonight. It's a great honor to be here at the New Canaan Library. And thank you all for being here as well. So, in April of 2016, and then this past April, a long time dream came true for me. I was able to travel to Cuba alone and shoot an in-depth documentary in my usual unconventional traveler style. I've always been extremely fascinated about Cuba. It was always the forbidden land with history filled with revolution. The Cuban revolution was an armed revolt conducted by Fidel Castro's 26th of July movement and its allies against the U.S.-backed authoritarian government of Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. The revolution began in July of 1953 and continued sporadically until the rebels finally ousted Batista on January 1st of 1959, replacing his government with a revolutionary socialist state. The 26th of July movement later reformed along communist lines, becoming the Communist Party in October of 1965. The Cuban Revolution had powerful domestic and international repercussions. In particular, it reshaped Cuba's relationship with the United States. Efforts to improve diplomatic relations have gained momentum in recent years. And then after President Obama, historic visit there in March of a few years ago with an effort to normalize our relations, certain restrictions immediately became more relaxed and I was allowed to go under the category of people to people. So I was able to travel alone, which is the way I normally need to travel around Cuba, a dream come true. People to people is non-tourist activities by getting to know and spending time with the local people. It was one of the ways you were allowed to get into Cuba. Not allowed anymore. Through the assistance of a neighbor and friend who is Cuban, I was able to secure the most important component, a good, reliable driver who would be willing to take me around the entire country at a reasonable rate. Now, due to the condition of many of the back roads, this kind of travel can be challenging. But after flying from New York City to Mexico City to Havana, I breezed through the airport where I heard the nicest words that warm my heart at the security gate. Welcome to Cuba. My passport was stamped. I went out the door looking for the man with the sign that said, Daryl Hawk. After finding Pablo, my driver, we headed to Havana in his 1953 Chevrolet. His car was in mint condition, and I knew I was in for one of the most unique road trips that I've ever taken. I had a great route planned starting in the wonderful and vibrant city of Havana for two days, and after that, the next, next two weeks were spent capturing the perennial colorful cities of Vanales, Sinfuegos, Trinidad, Santa Clara, and then Camaway, culminating on the fishing piers of Santiago de Cuba. Now, returning again this past April, Pablo and I began our journey in Camaway and continued on through the eastern part of the country, the Orient, 
uh, and we went through Santiago de Cuba, the Gran Piedra Mountains, Guantanamo. I've got a good story about Guantanamo. And then finally, the Baracoa area. So we covered most of the each eastern region on this last trip, as I said, known as the Orient. Cuba's diverse coastline, fertile uh, low-lying plains, and rich in sugarcane, renowned tobacco plantations, caves, and the small forgotten towns and villages will all be included in the documentary tonight. And what I discovered more than anything else was the strong heartbeat of the wonderful, warm, welcoming Cubanos who inhabit a challenging communist-ruled country. And even though communicating with language was difficult, these gracious and enterprising people loved to be photographed and welcomed me into their homes and world. Yes, this is a love story tonight. I don't know if I've ever fallen so much in love with people ever in all my travels for 30 years. And I've been to a lot of places. This country is still in a 1950s time warp due to a large degree that I did start seeing, but I did start seeing cell phone and email usage in the larger cities. And life in Cuba is open and interreactive. The Casa de Particulars or the family homes that I stayed in each night were comfortable and gave me the perfect perspective of what life is really like in Cuba. Many of these families have become my close friends and I hope to send them some American business and see them again in the future. Survivors by nature and necessity, Cubans have long displayed an almost inexhaustible ability to bend the rules and always work things out when it matters. They can make something out of nothing because of economic necessity. And in a small nation bucking modern social, socio-political realities, where monthly salaries top around the equivalent of US $25 a month, survival can often mean getting extremely innovative as a means of supplementing personal income. And never in all my travels have I ever experienced such a perfect combination of beautiful light, color, and perfect chemistry with the native people. I can honestly say that I've only just begun to truly discover Cuba. So uh, just to give you an idea of my route here, Havana, first trip, Benales, did a loop around here, all the way down here, down to Cienfuegos, through this region of Santa Clara, some main roads, some back roads, all the way up down through here to Camaway, and uh, spent some time in Camaway, and then I got down to, all the way down to Santiago de Cuba, but could not even explore Santiago de Cuba, I ran out of time, and um, needed to go back for a second time to do the entire Orient, um, and there I picked it up from Camaway down to Santiago de Cuba, over to Guantanamo, to Baracoa. Baracoa is the most eastern part of the country, it's the oldest town in, in Cuba, and in my mind it was the most beautiful. So you'll see that at the end. All right, so let's get on with the photos. I know that's really why you're here. And um, all paths start off in Havana. That's the car that I had for two weeks. The first trip, it was blue. On the second trip, the same car was white. <laughs> I asked Pablo, what happened? <laughs> he said, oh, we got in an accident and uh, he had to have the whole car repainted. So uh, it, was, it was a beautiful car, and I was riding really in, in style, for sure. What a unique road trip to be in a 1953 Chevrolet, I'll tell you. There's nothing like it. So there's Pablo taking off. You can see Che Guevara in the background. That's, that's Cuba. Revolutionary signs everywhere. So the first set of images you're going to see are all going to be from Havana. And this is the famous Malacan. You can see the beautiful uh, shoreline here. This is uh, the Malacan at sunrise. And, um, you know, as an in-depth, as a documentary photographer who does in-depth documentaries, um, it's all about the light. 
It really is. I'm chasing light, I'm following light, I'm always looking for light. Photography is painting with light. So I have to get up very early in the morning, very early to get the sunrise shots on my locations. And then of course I'm shooting all day long right till sunset and getting the sunset shots. But you know, the waves crashing against the Malacan seawall, guitars and voices harmonizing over a syncopated drum rhythm, sunlight across rotten peeling paintwork, street vendors calling out at 6 a.m. in magical morning light and color as a new day begins. No one could have invented Havana. It's too audacious, too contradictory, and despite 50 years of withering neglect, too damn beautiful. It's beautiful. I love Tavana. How does it, anyone's guess, maybe it's the swashbuckling history, maybe it's the survivalist spirit. Come with an open mind and prepare yourself for a long, slow seduction. So my style is to have my camera around my neck constantly all day long, shooting anything that happens to capture my eye. I like traveling alone. I am the unconventional traveler. Uh, my style is to travel alone and free as the wind. I don't like any distractions. So in other words, um, I don't really want to be with a group of people or anybody else except my wife sometimes. Uh, we do take trips together, but when I do these in-depth documentaries, I always travel alone. And I love just looking and absorbing myself and immersing myself into the uh, culture and the landscapes. That is a key word for me, immersing, immersing, immersing. It's all about immersing. The more you immerse, the more you will get out of this experience of travel, and the more it will rub off on you and your soul and your heart. So when I say immerse, I mean wandering the streets in Havana and engaging with the local people and looking for the color and looking for the light and looking for the right compositions with the architecture. It's all about observing. And I'm a very aware person. Um, I've never had any safety issues in all my years of traveling, knock on wood. And I have to say that I never felt safer in my life than I have in Cuba. It's just unbelievable. I was walking the streets late at night and never once felt you know, and under any kind of uh, safety concern, because crime is almost non-existent there, serious crime, I should say. Petty theft, sure, but nothing serious for, for most, most places in Cuba. And by the way, they have a problem with um, mosquitoes and, and uh, diseases by flies and so forth, so most of the hotels and the Casa de Particulars are exterminated um, once a week, and I woke up to a, an exterminator one morning, uh, exterminating my room and hallway, and I had to get out of there fast. <laughs> it was uh, really, really uh, difficult, but um, usually, uh, you know, in most cases, they give you warning, of course. So anyway, I was off exploring the streets of Havana, and uh, I ran into this woman. She was my date the very first night. <laughs> Rather attractive. Miss Havana, um, beautiful woman. This woman uh, is, is famous already. She's been in some magazines. Uh, they did a story of my documentary in a, a couple of photography magazines. And, uh, you know, it's just an example of how beautiful these people are and the beautiful cars. Everybody knows about these cars from the 1950s. They're everywhere. The, I would say that 80 to 90 percent of the cars in, in Cuba are are old and from the 50s. And just walking the streets, whether it's Havana or Santiago or any really city in, in Cuba, there's always street performers, musicians, artists. And then, I, as I mentioned, I was starting to see a little bit of uh, c cell phone and email usage, which is was just starting to begin to happen, I believe, in the last few years. Though most people are not using it because it's uh, cost prohibitive. And then, of course, you see the books on Cuba and all about the revolutionaries and, um, and the, you know, that's, how do you like that for a color? <laughs> and, you know, I often say that uh, photography is quite often luck. 
It's always being in the right place at the right time. And this is a case of luck to get a guy with a matching shirt in the car, <laughs> right? Probably the one time he wore that shirt, just for me. Anyway, I love the people. I love the cars. I love the architecture. Uh, I just love the feel and the rhythm and the, uh, I, I can't even put it into words, but my style is just to roam and engage people. Now, everybody in Cuba speaks Spanish, and very few of them, I have to say, speak English. Very few. And I don't really speak a lot of Spanish, but I do speak the universal language that's always gotten me around the world without any problems. Does anybody know what that is? Money. No, not money. <laughs> I smile a lot. <laughs> I smile wherever I go because I'm so happy with what I'm doing. I love people. I'm a man of the world. I love people so much from all, over, all, all countries. And I often say in my presentations, you can never judge a country by its government. Please, please don't. There's so many countries out there that are run by dictators and, and ruthless leaders, uh, and the people are completely different who live there. So you cannot be biased. You have to be open-minded and really get to know and research and study what's going on in these countries like I do. I do tremendous research. It's all part of the fun and appeal when I travel. The most important thing for me and the most exciting thing for me is to have a really great detailed map. I love looking at maps. The more detailed, the better. And that's where the journey begins. And once I set my sights on a location or country around the world, I do as much research as I can. The more research that you do on a place, the better off you're going to be when you're there. The less uh, surprises, unexpected things will unfold. You'll feel more confident and secure, especially when you travel alone like I do. So there's plenty of resources on the internet and um, great guidebooks. So these are all street scenes of Havana, the oldest tree in Havana. And um, I spent two full days here, and um, it was just a great way to begin uh, this great, great journey around Cuba. So um, this is Sir, uh, not Sir, Ernest Hemingway's house. Hemingway was a famous uh, writer, as we all know, who spent a good part of the year in Cuba and developed a strong relationship with the Cubans, and I'm sure uh, most of you are somewhat familiar with that. And uh, that's his boat, this is his office, and uh, Hemingway uh, conducted a lot of his work here. Uh, now you cannot go inside the house, but they have all the doors and windows open so you can photograph uh, all the rooms. So it's uh, exactly the way he had left it. Now, I talked about research, how important that is. I like the Lonely Planet Guide. And um, they had a little write-up in the, in the book about this artist who had created a, all these murals all over a neighborhood. It was quite amazing to see. And I've discovered other artists around the world that same way uh, in the Lonely Planet book. But this guy, he was incredible. There was about a half a dozen square blocks of just buildings and murals everywhere. Um, quite, quite stunning and beautiful and colorful. So naturally, uh, I wanted to photograph that as much as possible. And getting people into the, into the landscapes is a very important part of uh, the composition of photos uh, and quite often what magazines are looking for. So rather than just shooting the mirror, it's always a good idea to get uh, someone in the shot as well. And I asked my uh, guide and driver, Pablo, I said, I wanted to meet some of the Santeria people, which is a special religious sect in Cuba. And he said, well, that's going to be hard. They don't like being photographed. They all dress in white. But we did happen to come across a dance troupe uh, from the same religious sect, the Santeria. And uh, we got very lucky. We watched them dance and perform for about uh, an hour and a half. So I've had tremendous luck when I travel. Um, I, I seem to be always in the right place in the right time um, when things just unfold in front of me. This is the famous War Museum. And everybody loves dominoes and playing games on the streets. And you know, one of the things I love about Cuba so much, 
is that it's like going back in time, 70 years, and it's so pure and beautiful. And people aren't staring at phones or iPads. They're looking at each other. They're engaging with each other. There's a definite lack of technology, and I think it's a great, great positive thing in so many ways. I really do. Now, I know a lot of people will disagree and say technology is the answer to all, but I don't believe it. Uh, I believe that there's something very unique and special about the uh, people here uh, because of their lack of technology. They're living more in the moment. They're more aware of their surroundings and engaging with people, I, I think, uh, in so many ways that uh, we as Westerners don't seem to do anymore because we're so distracted by the technology. So that's just an observation that I wanted to make uh, about uh, technology in Cuba. Now we're moving over to the far western part of the region, which is Vinales. I had to get into the tobacco country. We all know Cuba is world famous for its cigars. And Pablo brought me to supposedly the most Im important, best tobacco grower in all of Cuba. There he is. And I did some environment, environmental portraits of him. But um, Vinales is a very special part of Cuba. It's very rural. It's very farm-like, agricultural. And I really enjoyed spending a couple hours one morning watching uh, Don Pedro here roll cigars and the whole beginning to end process of cigar making. And then I had a cigar myself. I came back with about 50 cigars and uh, still enjoy one once in a while. But Vinales is a very, very special place. Um, it's a region in rolling rustic canvas of fertile rock, ru rust, red oxen, furrowed fields, thatched tobacco tr drying houses, and sombrero chad clad country folk. And here again, just roaming into some of these stores, you know, you can see that the lack of supplies, the lack of food is, is evident everywhere. You, your heart goes out to these people. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think I fell in love with Cuba so much is that they're such beautiful, wonderful people, um, but they have so little in, in, uh, in, the, in the form of materialism. And certainly food is always a struggle to put on the table. At the same time, they give you the shirt off their back if you needed something. That's the way they are. This is a famous mural in the Vinales area, Mural del Prehistorica. It's 120 meters long. It was a painting designed in 1961 by Levagildo Gonzalez Murillo, a follower of Mexican artist Diego Rivera. And it took 18 people four years to complete. And this is an entrepreneur in the front who makes a little money posing in front of the mural. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, right? You got to love the entrepreneurship of the Cubans. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, this is something, I, this is a photo that I love. It's uh, been in magazines. It's just a, a day unfolding, uh, everybody going off to school, a typical street in Vinales. I love going to schools. I love kids. I love young people. I love their innocence. I love the way they interact with each other. And uh, I always try to go to schools in any country. I've been to schools in Bhutan, in, the, in uh, Kashmir, um, all over South America. It's just uh, it's something magical about being at a school and watching. Sometimes they let you into the classroom and you can observe and even take pictures. I do have a book here tonight that's in the back called Into the Heart of Cuba, and this is my cover of the book. Um, and you're more than welcome to take a look at it on your way out. And uh, I do sell these books. If you're interested, just uh, take one of my cards back here at the table and um, send me an email. Each book is self-published. This is an example, this series right here is an example of um, taking the time and making the right decision of not driving too fast and zooming by what I thought was something powerful in the, in the landscape and the, in the people. Um, we were racing along trying to get to another destination, and when I see something, and I do see things all day long, 
Uh, I've learned to just stop, go back, and spend some time shooting, and that's what I did here. And I'm glad I did it, because I did end up with a nice series of photographs. So I can't stress enough that the importance of taking it slow when you travel. Don't try to take on too much with your itineraries. It's best to spend time and immerse yourself. Walk the streets. Wander. Don't be in the car all the time driving. You certainly can't take any pictures when you're driving. And allow, you know, allow the time necessary to really explore these areas. Uh, I, and I, creating an itinerary is a fine art. And I've always enjoyed it. I tweak my itineraries constantly. I probably do about 12, 15 drafts on an itinerary before I leave. And then I get there and the itinerary still gets off kilter. But that's OK. Um, I don't mind making changes. I go with the flow. I never have reservations anywhere wherever, whenever I travel. This is a cave that I went to and explored. Very beautiful, silent, special uh, cave system. And um, I went there at the end of the day where there were other people lined up. And I said, nah, this isn't for me. I came back the next morning. I was the first one in the cave and had an incredible experience. There's nothing like being in a cave system all alone because it's the silence and the solitude of a cave is very, very uh, intense. And so I was glad I made that decision. So that's why you have to just be you know, flexible and go with the flow sometimes. Here's a, a, a Santeria that I was telling you about, all dressed in white. Now, wherever you go, you see the constant signs of Fidel and um, Che Guevara and uh, these great you know, communist leaders, revolutionary leaders. It's all you see as far as advertising or billboards or signs. You don't see any kind of commercial advertising of anything whatsoever anywhere in Cuba. So is it a form of brainwashing? Yes, of course. Um, and it's all, it's all certainly part of my documentary tonight. Just roaming the streets. I'm looking for interesting faces. If I see a face that has character, um, you know, I photograph it. I have no hesitation in engaging anybody. And quite often we, we don't speak a word of English or Spanish. It's just facial ex smiling. I let them know what I'm doing. I show them the camera. I shoot fast. And then I'm on my way again. Now, everybody loves pictures. And now with digital cameras, you show them the picture. You show them what they're getting. They put a, they're so happy and you put a smile on their face. Maybe nobody ever photographed this guy before. I don't know, but I made his day. And they, they take it as a compliment that you saw something in them that nobody else had ever seen. And that's the beauty of what I do is I, I make people happy. It's all about positive experiences and happiness. And my documentaries show the beauty in the world. I'm not here to show you the dark side of anything. I know people do presentations on India and all they show are people lying in the streets. No, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to show you the, the beauty of Cuba and, all the, and what makes it work and what it's all about and the day-to-day -day life and the beautiful people and the beautiful landscapes. You know, riding in these, these uh, horse carts was amazing, amazing experience. And the beautiful architecture, we're in Sinfuegos now. And um, Sinfuegos is a beautiful city right on the, on the water. It's and long seduced travelers from around the world with its elegance, its enlightened French spirit, and feisty Car Caribbean panache. If Cuba has a Paris, this is definitely it. And it's arranged around the country's most spectacular natural bay. It's a nautical city with an enviable waterside setting, a dazzling treasure box of 19th century architectural glitz. And there's a pervading sense of tranquility resonating through the spruced up colonial streets. And this is just a festival that I happened to come across when I was in San Fuegos. And by the way, my good friends from uh, Wilton who are Cuban, or she's Cuban, uh, this is where her family's from. 
and um, she was an important advisor for me on this whole trip and planning it and um, uh, just telling me a lot of important things about when I was there. One of the things that she emphasized is don't talk about politics when you're in Cuba. <laughs> not a good idea. And I'm not a political person myself. That's, politics is the last thing on my mind when I'm traveling in these countries. So you don't want to engage them in politics because they can get into a lot of trouble if they say anything negative about the government or about Castro, or anything negative at all. They can go to prison, jail, for years. There's, everybody has stories about relatives being in prison for speaking out or saying something. And it's awful. So you have to be careful. And there's people listening everywhere on the streets who work for the government. So if I did engage with anybody at all in a political conversation, it was always in the car or very private. But it didn't happen very often. The long lines just waiting for basic goods and necessities. I saw a long line, a, line, a mob 10 times bigger than this one day in Baracoa. And I kept asking people, what's everybody lined up for? And new shoes came into town. You know, they get shoes once a month. And this was the shoe de delivery day, and everybody wanted a chance at those new shoes. People probably lined up since midnight to get in there at 9 in the morning. It's very touching. And I went into the store and watched everybody look at the shoes and buy the shoes, and um, it, was, uh, it, it put my life in perspective, let me put it to you that way. And that's another reason why I travel. <laughs> There's many reasons. But I travel because... These places always put my life in perspective, and that's very important um, to come back and look at life a little differently when you see how other people live and how they struggle. This is so typical of a lot of the stores I went into. There's hardly anything here left. There's always food shortages. And... Um, You know, they have their ups and their downs. They have their good times. Some good periods are better than others. You know, one thing about tourism that I learned in, in an interesting story was that, you know, the food supply is only limited to so many people in Cuba. And um, actually, when tourism got very popular uh, in the last couple of years, a lot of the food that would normally go to the stores to the people who lived there was all going to the hotels and restaurants that catered to the Westerners. So a lot of the Cuban people were, were suffering from food shortages even more because of tourism. So it's a very complex situation. Tourism is good in a lot of ways because it gets money into the hands of the people. But if it's taking away their food, that's not a good thing. Look at this face. Does that say it all? Yeah, that looks like a Walker Evans dust ball. Um, I went over to Santa Clara, very famous cemetery there. This is where all the important dignitaries uh, are buried. I like cemeteries. They're very interesting. Tells you a lot about a country. But then I spent some time wandering away from the cemetery. I wandered into a little, um, like a slum dwelling area, very, very poor, impoverished neighborhood. I was waiting for my driver. He went into town to get a beer, and he didn't come back for a while. So I decided to make the most use out of my time. I, can't, I didn't just want to sit there in the hot sun. I walked around this neighborhood, and I ended up having some of the most meaningful times and experiences of the whole trip because these people were really, really friendly and loving and were so excited to see me because... I don't think anybody else wanders around this little neighborhood. But I got to see a whole other way of living, and it's uh, you know, very, very touching, and uh, they invited me in for food and drinks, and uh, you know, I just um, never forget that day. You can see the cobblestone streets here. Tight clothing is popular. Very colorful clothing. This was a, a, a lucky shot to be in the right place at the right time. 
Uh, this is run in magazines, the color, the composition, the lighting, yeah, everything just works well together here. I'm still in touch with somebody from Cuba now for a year and a half, uh, a family that I stayed with. Uh, there was a, um, a woman there uh, who was the daughter and um, very, very poor, had nothing going for her and uh, she wanted to start a hair salon. So I've been emailing her back and forth for a year and a half and um, sending her some money periodically. And I'd like to think that I've made a difference in her life because she now has a hair salon going, which is very meaningful to me. Otherwise, she wouldn't have never been able to, to start this. But it's kind of funny because I'll get emails from her in Spanish, then I have to Google Translate every email she sends to me, then I have to compose it, what I want to say to her, and then Google Translate it back to her again in Spanish. So it takes a little doing, but it's, it's well worth it. This guy here is famous. Uh, I thought I was getting a very colorful guy with a unique shot, and then I came back, um, and like a few months later, I saw the same guy in one of the guidebooks. <laughs> so he obviously walks around Trinidad, you know, posing for everybody to make a little extra money. This is, you know, the houses are quite open, open, the doors are open. When you walk the streets, you can look in, say hi, everybody's friendly, they'll invite you in. So this is Trinidad. Uh, this is heading further east now, a beautiful, maybe the most, one of the most popular cities in all of Cuba. It's one of a kind. It's a perfectly preserved Spanish settlement where the clock stopped kicking stopped ticking in 1850 and have yet to restart. The town remains a quiet air in its rambling cobbled streets, replete with leather-faced country folk, snorting donkeys, and melodic guitar-wielding troubadours. Another war museum. And uh, Trinidad is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's probably the one city that, besides Savannah, that everybody wants to get to and see. And it's doable because it's only a few hours away from Havana. So I think you can get there in a half a day pretty easily. Artists are everywhere. Now somebody made a reference to money, giving money. That's a very tricky um, thing to discuss because when people give me their time for a portrait and have nothing and don't even have shoes on their feet, it's hard not to give them a little money. So I do it. But I also don't think it's a good precedent to be doing it time after time and time a lot because it does encourage begging around the world. And it become, it's become a big, big problem in a lot of countries, it's so bad that people will swarm you. I mean, literally swarm you. You'll have a crowd of 20 people all around you. And it can be dangerous. They're, and they really tr could pickpocket you, steal money from you, cut open your backpack, because they think you're going to give them money. So it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You want to help people, and, but you don't want to encourage begging around the world. Now, I didn't see any begging in Cuba. Nothing. This is a unique country. I didn't see any homeless people. I didn't see drugs once, anywhere. But what I do give is baseball cards or football cards to every kid I see wherever I travel. So I, give, I go with several hundred, 500, 600 cards and I hand them out everywhere. They've been handed out in Bhutan, Ladakh, Argentina, Peru, Cuba, you know, new, everywhere around the world. This, the kids just love it. It lights up their faces. And it's uh, the next best, best thing in my mind to, uh, to giving them money. But I do give a little bit of money every now and then for portraits, for sure. So now we're hitting the coastline. I saw some fishermen over here and uh, watched them go about catching some fish with their nets. It's very interesting. And you can see it's not a big catch. Maybe it would be good on a Ritz cracker. <laughs> but 
But they had a lot of fun and enjoyed it, so that's the important thing. A car stuck on the beach, and I did my first trip to Cuba, I did spend um, a half a day on a beach, <laughs> just relaxing and putting the camera away. You know, sometimes you just have to do that, relax a little bit. Um, I have this tendency to just to shoot nonstop for sometimes two or three weeks. When I was in Bhutan, I didn't stop shooting for a month straight, and I was only getting two hours of sleep at night because of the insomnia I was experiencing because of the high altitudes. I didn't bring any sleeping pills or anything, and um, that was tough. That was tough. I didn't realize how al high altitudes cause insomnia. But anyway, here we are in Trinidad still in the center square, a very lively square with music and dancing. And, you know, that Cuba is just so alive. It's so colorful. It's, um, it's all your senses going into overdrive. It's the sights. It's the sounds. It's the smell. It's, it's everything working together in harmony. And I'm traveling as free as the wind. I couldn't be happier. I, I just, I love what I'm doing so much. That's why I've been going strong for 30 years. And I will be going strong for another 40 years. Okay? <laughs> uh, at least I'll try anyway. There's, nothing's going to stop me. And that's one of the reasons I chose photography as a profession. Because I wanted to always do what I love the most. I wanted to have my own business and do what I love the most. And I fell in love with photography at a young age. I grew up with National Geographic magazine that had a strong influence on me. That's my Bible, National Geographic. And um, I grew up with a family of world travelers. Both my parents and grandparents were world travelers. They traveled to remote places around the world before a lot of people ever went there. My grandfather was a serious amateur photographer. He used to give slideshows to his friends down in uh, Westchester. And, uh, you know, these are the seeds that were planted at a young age in my mind, if you're wondering where this all came from. It was the combination of world travelers in my family and National Geographic magazine, which I've had as a, a subscription now for um, fifth, over 50 years. I never get tired of it. I always, I have a tremendous curiosity about the world around me. Explorers are driven by curiosity. Exploration is curiosity in motion. That's what we're doing. We're in motion constantly, looking for things, trying to discover things, exploring the world around us, and trying to make the world a better, a better place in our own individual way. And in a sense, I'm really a visual explorer. That's my, my niche more than anything because I'm always looking and uh, documenting what I see with the camera. So many good memories. A man walking his pig. And so now we're in the very central part of the, of the city, of, and of the country, I should say, in Camaway. Uh, Camaway is a, nothing but a maze. Its odd layout of streets is the byproduct of two centuries spent fighting off musket-toting pirates like Henry Morgan. And uh, these tough times led to the fledging settlement to develop a peculiar street pattern uh, designed to confuse pillaging invaders and provide cover for its long-suffering residents. So it was hard getting around Camaway at night after a couple of beers, finding my room. I always traveled with my card of the Casa de Particular. Always had it with me because more times than not, I could not find my room at night. I mean, the streets were dark. <laughs> And the streets are, are a little confusing to be in with to get around, so I was just showing my card to people and they'd point me in the right direction. And I always got back okay. I traveled in these horse carts at night. It was great fun. Just the sound of the, of the, of the horse's hooves on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the pavement, something I won't forget. So always looking for subject matter. The camera 
is my heart and my soul. It's an extension of who I am. It's my greatest friend. It's always with me. It's my life. And I hope to bump up the number of documentaries that I do each year now. You know, I am very busy. I run a full-time studio in Wilton uh, and do a lot of different kinds of photography. But it's this work that I have the greatest passion for. And I, I hope to be doing uh, at least three or four of these a year sometime soon. Camaway was quite an extraordinary place. Anybody have a mojito? Raise your hands. They're very good, aren't they? And like I said, the signs are everywhere. So now we're making our way further towards the east. The eastern part of Cuba, the Orient, is definitely more communist. That's the general consensus. The further east you get, the more communist it gets especially in the region of Guantanamo and Santiago. And uh, that means there's more, you know, loyalists to Fidel and, and uh, the present leaders. Um, where maybe in the western part of the country you'll see, uh, you know, a lot more resistance to this kind of leadership. So it's a mixed bag. But people are frustrated. You know, they want to speak out, they want change, they want they want a right to have access to money and food. They want their freedom. They do want their freedom, but when you're controlled by a communist government that's ruthless, um, it's very, very difficult to force that kind of change. And so I'm very concerned about the future of Cuba. That's how passionate and how much of a deep love I have for this country. Matter of fact, so much so that I, I emailed 15 times the, the consulate in New York, and I told them I wanted to have a meeting with them. And I wanted to go in and meet with them. I did finally get a meeting with the head of media, all media for Cuba. I told them about my documentary, and I told them that I wanted to go to Havana and present it to Castro. Yeah, I know it's a long shot. This was be right before Fidel died. Um, and I, I, with the, the strong belief that somehow I could present this documentary to Fidel Castro and somehow engage him in a conversation that might be open to some kind of photographer's, you know, independent person who's non-political way of seeing the world and thinking that maybe there's a possibility for change of some kind, maybe more towards a socialist direction, which is the way it should have been all along. I'm not saying it should be a, a, a capitalist country. We certainly don't want McDonald's and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere in Cuba because it will ruin its special um, flavor, its special culture. It's what makes it so unique right now. So there's a lot of things that need to be protected and preserved with Cuba. The architecture, it's falling apart. They don't have the money to, to put into the infrastructures or the buildings. But at the same time, um, it was just a pipe dream. It, it never happened. Um, Fidel died. And now I'm under the understanding that uh, even though Raul is retiring next year, um, this new leader who's ready to take over is um, just as um, communist, if not more so, than the Castros. That's the word I got. Now, maybe it's going to be proven wrong. I don't know. But that's what some insiders have told me which is a shame, because it means probably that Cuba's not going to change very much for a long time to come. This new leader, I think, is on the younger side. He may be in his 40s or 50s, which means he could be around for 30 or 40 years. What a shame. You know, I wanted to present to the Castros a, f a vision of ecotourism and geotourism that I think would be a, a big part of the solution to uh, the problems with Cuba, getting money into the right hands of the people through entrepreneurship and tourism without ruining the cultural uh, purity of the island. That was my goal um, and still a, a dream of mine. 
love this shot because I caught it early in the morning, right after a, a light rain, and the color and the light and the reflection here all work well together. So you got to get up early in the morning. This is right before the sun rose. And walk the streets because that's where you see the best light. Early and late. That's a dog guarding a house. And so this is all Santiago de Cuba, the city of the revolutionaries. It's the second largest city in the country and nestled in a valley of the Sierra Maestra that is pierced by a pouch shaped bay on the Caribbean Sea. It was founded in 1522 and was the focal point of the Spanish-American War. And in 1953, Castro led an attack against the Moncada barracks in the city. The attack was repulsed by government troops, but the name 26th of July movement became attached to Castro's cause. In 1956, after his release from prison, he led a small group of supporters back into the Sierra Maestra. And although they've isolated the city from the rest of the island, it remains in the government hands until Castro's final victory in 1959. And during the next two decades, uh, Santiago de Cuba experienced a rapid growth of population and services. This is up in the Gran Piedro um, mountain area that I went renowned for uh, coffee, coffee plantation. But Santiago de Cuba is the center of an agricultural and mining region with exports that include copper, iron manganese, sugar, and fruit. Ah, the famous El Moro Church. This was quite a special spiritual uh, experience for me. The most famous church in all of Cuba. Just absolutely gorgeous, stunning inside and out. And I'm sorry, I, I, I said the wrong name here. Um, the actual name of this church is um, Nuestra Basilica de Nuestra Señora del Cobre, del Cobre Church. This is the most famous church probably in all of Cuba. And uh, it was wonderful to be here and, and uh, experience it. And then I went over to, um, this is El Moro, a famous castle. Uh, and fortress, a fortress, I should say, that was uh, built to, to fight off pirates. And then I made my, made my way closer to Guantanamo. I had on my agenda to try to get a photograph of the infamous uh, Guantanamo prison. <clears throat> but after doing extensive research, I quickly learned that you can't get a vantage point anymore of that prison. It's not really possible to get a photo of it. They've got it so uh, guarded off now, even from the main road or high up on a hill, you can't, you can't get access to it. I had one um, somewhat tense experience on this trip that was really my fault. Um, <clears throat> I was going through a checkpoint. There's checkpoints everywhere in Cuba with police. Um, and especially in Guantanamo, that's an area you don't want to get pulled over or have a problem with. And we did. And the reason we did is because I went past the checkpoint with Pablo, and then I said to Pablo, I'd like to go back again. There was a sign that I really wanted to photograph. And um, he said, well, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. It was this sign here. So we went back. I got the photograph of the sign, but we got pulled over. And it was scary. I mean, we were there for like three hours. The guy was just questioning him over and over and over again. Uh, it looked kind of funny that I was there alone as an American, which is very unusual. And, um, you know, they were suspicious. Checked the car, checked him. They didn't let us go for three hours. Uh, I was starting to picture myself in Guantanamo that night. But we got through. And the adventures continued. So dancing in the streets dancing on the mountains, the spontaneity and purity of Cuban culture as we make our way to Baracoa, my favorite city in the whole island. This is a place that I can spend, <clears throat> I think, 
a month or two every year, and I, I fell in love with Barakoa. Uh, it was just colorful. It had a very laid-back vibe to it. Um, the architecture was stunning, and it wasn't too big, but not too small. It was just the right, right size town. And um, it's the far eastern part of the country. It's where, uh, where uh, Columbus first landed. And um, that was the beginning of Cuba, 1492. And then Barraco was founded in 1511. And these are all street scenes in Barracoa. And it, you know, the thing about Barracoa is, is that it has these um, beautiful um, beaches on the outskirts of the town, north of Barracoa, and then an incredible national park that I'm about to take you to, <laughs> that um, was probably the most memorable uh, experience of my whole uh, journeys throughout Cuba. And that's called, um, Humboldt National Park. But in the meantime, these are the streets of Baracoa, the people who live there. They've got a really nice hotel there on the top of a mountain. But remember, I stay in Casa de Particulares. I like living with the people in their houses. The money's going to the people. When you stay in a hotel, the money is going to the government in Castro. Uh, it's just that simple. Beautiful church there with uh, artifacts from Columbus. This is a very famous artifact. And then we're making our way to the northern part of Baracoa. This was a long, tough two-hour drive crossing rivers. And I wanted to get to these nation this national park, Humboldt. I heard so much about it. Uh, I knew it was going to be an amazing experience. I went past these beautiful remote beaches that were so unspoiled. Spent a little time on the beaches. This uh, part of Cuba has the best chocolate in maybe the whole world. It's unbelievable uh, how, how great that chocolate was. And here I had to hire a different driver and guide because you needed a four-wheel drive vehicle. Pablo's car would never make it this far. So uh, once in a while you have to drop the driver you have and, and move on to a, a four-wheel drive to access, uh, you know, roads like this. But we got high up into the, uh, the forest and um, the park, and all of a sudden I was in just a nature lover's paradise. I was experiencing all these incredible um, plants and flowers, and uh, just everywhere I looked, it was something new and different. This is the world's smallest frog, by the way. It has that distinction in um, Humboldt National Park. There's a thousand flowering plants here, 145 types of fern, and hundreds and hundreds of different bird species. It's, it was truly incredible, and what was so great about it, I had it all to myself, because not many people who go to Cuba ever go this far. This is the farthest east you can go. And... Um, you know, I felt like it was a dream come true. This was almost in some ways uh, Shangri-La for me. I've always had this dream about finding Shangri-La after reading, uh, you know, these books about it. And um, I've been all through the Himalayas and uh, been to some areas that almost could pass for it. But when I was in this part of Cuba, it really was so untouched by time that uh, I didn't want to leave. I even took a, uh, an oxen cart ride with this guy uh, to get past these rivers, and then I walked up the river a mile, waited with my camera, and I came across the most incredible waterfall. It was totally, totally uh, magical. And then there was a leaving Baracoa. We had, there was a mudslide a few hours before. You can see what can happen to the roads here. Uh, they do get these terrible mudslides sometime, but um, we made it back to uh, Kamaway. We completed the second journey together, uh, a true uh, circumnavigation of the entire country of Cuba. And most of all, uh, I made a lot of friends. I still have friends there, and I've developed a very important relationship with a very special country. 
and Cubans here in Connecticut and everywhere. Uh, this is a lifelong relationship I'm going to have, and uh, there's more to come. So thank you for being here tonight.